All right. Thank you, Carmonas, for uh, reading the scripture. Um, when I was 24 years old, Kelly and I had just um, returned from our honeymoon, and it was the first few days in our uh, little small two-bedroom apartment in southern Indiana, and there's wedding gifts spread out all throughout the living room, and it's time to start to now make this place our own. I had lived in the apartment uh, by, by myself for a couple months before we got married, so what that meant was there was a sum total of zero decorations in the house, nothing, plain walls, absolutely nothing, and so there I was for the first time in my life, uh, my first time in my adult life, looking at curtain rods and drapes. I was 24, I moved uh, out of the house at 18 after I graduated, and I had not hung any drapes uh, or curtains before. So up until that point in my life, I never had any reason to, but this was my moment. This, this was uh, my time to shine in front of my new bride. So I grabbed my screwdriver, and I got my uh, power drill, and I tapped the trigger twice for good measure, because that's what you do with a power drill, and I gave my best Tim the Tool Man Taylor impression, and I went off. No, actually, I didn't. I only owned a screwdriver, so I actually made that part up about the power drill, but I faked it until I made it. I, it that's the kind of story of my life, but 90 minutes later, I returned to the living room where my wife was, and it doesn't matter that I only hung one rod and one set of drapes. I did it. I got it done. And I'm proud to say now that at age 37 and having moved 347 times, I am a pro at hanging curtain rods. I, yes, amen. I, from the living room, amen. I am a pro. We don't have any curtains in my house now. We, plantation shutters are amazing. They're my excuse to not hang those stupid curtain rods anymore. But that's besides the point. Okay, so after moving so many times, I gained the ability to do something I couldn't do before. See, before, I didn't have the wisdom to measure twice and hang once. I didn't have the understanding of how to install the curtain rods the right way. This was 2007. We didn't have Google and YouTube. We had Ask Jeeves, okay? So we, we, didn't, we didn't have this kind of stuff for me to be able to get the counsel to do the right way of hanging this. And we were too poor to afford the internet in our little two-bedroom southern Indiana apartment. And I sure as heck wasn't going to ask my wife to come in and help because she would call my father-in-law, right? Okay? And we weren't going to have that. And I'm in the Clayton's house, and I didn't know Rodney Clayton at the time, okay? So I made do what I could. But that's what wisdom and understanding and counsel are all about. Not Rodney Clayton, but that's what wisdom, counsel, and understanding are all about. Ability, advantage, usefulness, power, and might. And you can see this in Proverbs 21.30. Let's, let's look at it in Proverbs 21.30. It says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. This proverb is like many proverbs. It has uh, two lines, line A and line B. And in line A, it says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel. Line B can avail against the Lord. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to just, uh, pro we'll probably look at this passage so much, maybe uh, uh, from today, you'll have Proverbs 2130 memorized. We're going to look at it so much, but let's just lift each of these nouns from line A and tag it to line B, okay? So Proverbs 21.30, no wisdom can avail against the Lord. No understanding can avail against the Lord. No counsel can avail against the Lord. Wisdom, understanding, and counsel are three perspectives for power, getting stuff done, they are practices of might and power and advantage and gaining advantage. Look, if you were to go to war, would you just run into war or would you seek out wisdom, understanding, and counsel? You would not go to war without some kind of intel, right? I mean, that's what Proverbs 20, verse 18. It's just the, the next chapter over, maybe on, your, on the same page. Proverbs 20, verse 18. Plans are established by counsel, 
by wise guidance, wage war. So if you want to get the best of something, if you want to avail someone, if you want to come against someone, first you seek wisdom, understanding, and counsel. And, and I, I love, I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any means. I took maybe one semester of it. But when you look at this in the original language in Hebrew, it's a really short statement. It's beautiful. It literally says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against Yahweh. Okay. So if God's wisdom is going this way, and your wisdom is going this way, you're going against the grain. You're, you're going the wrong way. You're a fool. Because you said in your heart, if there is a God, He's over here and I'm over here, we're at complete odds. Or if God's understanding goes this way and your understanding goes this way, and you decide to lean on your own understanding, the Bible says that your path will be crooked. Or if God's counsel goes this way and your counsel goes this way, Proverbs says over and over and over again, this way seems like life, but it will actually lead to your destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to hell. And do you remember when Eve, and back from the very first pages of the Bible, um, things were beautiful in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 3, things go wrong, and it gives us a lot of insight to why things are the way that they are in our world now. Okay, so if you, even if you don't have any um, understanding of the Bible, you know nothing about this, this old book here. There, God told the first humans, Adam and Eve, he told them that you can enjoy everything I created. All this is yours. Go have fun. Enjoy the waters, the, the rocks, the trees. Name the animals. All this. This is yours. Have all of this. One thing you can't have. One thing, and I know better than you, that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil over there. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. Well, what happened? Eve eats of the forbidden fruit. She saw that the tree, let's just look at it in Genesis chapter 3. We'll flip over there so you can see it. We'll lift it straight out of the text. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one, what? Wise. She took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. What did she do? She received counsel from an enemy of God who would seek to avail God. She received counsel from a serpent. She um, understood the tree as a delight when God said it was dangerous. And she sought to gain wisdom against God. Isn't it amazing? The first human act of trying to seek out wisdom is actually foolishness. And it ruins everything. She and Adam sought to avail against the Lord. And now you and I can read this, and we don't think in terms of, I live my life trying to avail against God. I don't think many people, um, at least maybe who might be listening, think, whatever I do today, I'm going to make sure I avail against God. I don't think that is probably on the forefront of our mind, it's easier for us to kind of assign this over to maybe some of our atheist friends or agnostic friends or people who just don't really care about God or who could, you know, uh, it's just so irrelevant. We like to think this proverb has to do more with philosophical arguments than everyday life. But chances are, if you are a Christian, you have wrestled with decision making. And more often than not, you've prayed and you've sought counsel as far as what do I do and and uh, you haven't maybe gotten anywhere and at some point you've even googled um, God what door do I take and you just open up a wormhole and then you talk to someone else and you, and you hear somebody say hey you know what here's the advice I'll give you when God closes a door he opens a window let me tell you right now this morning today July 12th 2020. That is the dumbest cliche I have ever heard. If you have received that counsel, reject it. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Look, if God shut the door, he doesn't want you going in, right? Doesn't just common sense tell you that if a door is shut and locked, don't go in that room? 
Isn't that the purpose of a door being shut and locked? Don't go in there. Everyday life tells us. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. You can be four years. My son knows if mommy and daddy's door is shut, don't go in. If sister's door is shut, don't go in. Ooh, who, who's the window? You know, like, no, everyday life tells us the purpose of a door, locked door, is that you don't go in. And look, even more, who said God opened that window? I mean, look, if you live in Pecan Grove, maybe God had to slam the door shut because the foundation's jacked up and the window got pushed up in the process, right? Or, or maybe the, that window, the latch is broke and the wind blows it open and inside that house is a bunch of serpents. How, see, so what we do in trying to avail against God is it's amazing that we want something so bad. We want something so bad, our heart delights in so much that we'll use God to get our ends and we'll define it as wisdom because we had a nice little short pithy proverb that someone told us. That's not in scripture. And we try, that's how we try to avail against God. So what are you doing? You're assuming some kind of wisdom, some kind of understanding, some kind of counsel that you think that God is withholding from you. Underneath your belief, you think that God would actually withhold your best interest from you on some level, and it's unbelief. And this is the genius of Proverbs. Proverbs, uh, please be careful. Remember this, Proverbs are not promises. There's not a whole lot of promises in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are short statements. Proverbs are short, pithy statements based on long experiences. And this proverb isn't promising you that if you're going through a season of life that everything is going well, that feels like you've availed against God, then somehow you are the exception. Look, you may be going through a season of life right now where you rely on your own wisdom, your own understanding, and your own counsel, and things are going well for you. Don't think you've availed against God. Because in the long run, your lack of God-centeredness, the lack of God-centeredness and using God for your ends will be to your ruin. He's going this way and you're going this way. Yes, so stack up all the atheist arguments. Bring in and gather all the agnostic accusations. Bring in the rage of the nations and none of them can avail against God. John Piper says, no sage, no professor, no psychologist. This is one implication of this proverb. And this is the folly that so many will bring when they try to avail against God and say, hey, uh, you know, there, there can't be a God because if, God, if there is a God, he's got to be all good and all powerful. And he can't be all good because look at all the evil and suffering that exists in this world, right? Or he can't be really all powerful because... Uh, look, there's so much suffering, surely he would step in if, if, he, uh, if he were powerful enough. But look, don't buy into that line of thinking. Let me tell you why. It assumes there's only two attributes of God, benevolence and power, right? But what if God's also wise and he knows more than you? This, this little phrase, wisdom, understanding, and counsel, tells us it actually shows up uh, only a couple other times in the, um, in the Old Testament, and one of which is from Job, okay? And if anybody wrestled with God's power and God's goodness, it was Job, okay? If anybody knew and asked questions of God's power and God's goodness, it was Job. And ironically, Job existed 400 years before Moses. So before there was the Exodus, the Ten Commandments, all of that, Job knew of God. And this is what Job knew. Job chapter 12, verse 13. Job says this, with God are wisdom and might and counsel. We've heard those before, haven't we? Wisdom and might and counsel and understanding. So maybe God is also wise, but I'm not speaking in a university classroom setting this morning. I'm in a living room, and so are you. And you're probably in your boxers, or your PJs, or your three-year-old has thrown so many Cheerios on the floor now you've given up on this. I understand. I've been there throughout this whole time, the whole time. Like, this is just crazy, right? We're sitting on our couch, and we're thinking, this world is a zoo. 
doing church on TV for months. What is going on, God? Proverbs 21.30 applies to us right now. So listen, what, whatever it is you think about COVID-19, whatever it is you think about social distancing and mask, whatever it is you think you know about conspiracy theories, whatever it is, whether you're for them or against them, the decisions, them being the decisions that are being made right now in the world, what we know right now, is that years later, we will realize we know a fraction of what we know then. What we know right now is a fraction of what we will know years from now. And we all experience that. Now, the difference is some of us are, you know, if you're bent on saying it's a conspiracy, you'll probably years from now say it's still a conspiracy. If you're saying, no, this was actually wise things that we did, you'll probably still draw the same conclusions. But either way, whatever perspective, the reality is, we know a fraction right now of what we will know in the future. It's 13 years later. I know how to hang curtains. I don't do it, but I know how to hang curtains. I've got a client who is a pilot, a commercial airline pilot, and he told me that he thought he knew that all that there was to know about flying airplanes after he had been a pilot for 15 years. He's now been a pilot for 30 years, and he said, Stephen, I thought I knew everything at 15 years. 30 years in, I was just starting to scratch the surface at 15 years. How much more is this when we come to the wisdom, the understanding, counsel, and might of God? The Bible calls God the ancient of days for a reason. Isaiah chapter 40, we won't go there, but Isaiah 40 says that God holds in the hollow of his hand, hollow, right here, okay, in the hollow of his hand, all the waters on the earth. Isaiah 40 verse 12 also says, and we won't go to it, you can just write down and flip back later, it also says that he marks off the heavens with a span. So let's do this, okay? If you've got a pool or next time you're swimming, I want you, when you come out of the water, And I'll give you two hands, okay? I want you to cup out of that water, all the water in the pool, and hold it up like this, and look at what's in your hand, and then look at how much more water is in the pool. Okay? The Bible says God with one hand holds all the waters in the world. Or next time um, you are out on a starry night, I want you to take your your right hand, take your left, whatever, and I want you to lift your your, uh, thumb, and I want you to lift your pinky, and this is a span right here, and I want you to hold out your arm like this. You can even kind of close one eye. And I want you to see how much of the sky you can get between here and here, okay? And the Bible says that God marks off, He marks off the heavens with a span. So what you might get from here to here could be like Earth to Mars maybe. God gets billions of light years between here and here right? That's marking off with a span. God does that easily, and it is no struggle for Him. I cannot tell you how many times I have prayed for something over and over and over, and I thought I was so sincere, and I knew I wanted it, only to have God say, no, or not yet. And I cannot tell you how many times in my walking with the Lord, I have looked back and said, Thank you, God, for withholding from me what I thought was wise. I cannot tell you how many times I have said, God, I thought I understood and I thought I knew, but thank you for not giving me what I was asking for. I had no idea. There was so much more. There was so much more. And God, you gave me what I would have given myself had I known what you know, God. And God, I'm so glad that you aren't a figment of my imagination. Look, if if your view of God doesn't actually make you to have to turn, he's probably a figment of your imagination. You probably created him to agree everything that you believe and to affirm and to make you feel better. And he's probably not the genuine God of the Bible. I'm so grateful, God, that I cannot avail you. You are the rock sovereignty that undergirds my life and guides my life and calls me to rest. So here's the question. Where do we 
find wisdom, understanding, and counsel that isn't at odds with God, that isn't at odds. The good news this morning is that wisdom, understanding, and counsel are not found in a set of facts. It doesn't depend on your education level. If we're talking about wisdom, understanding, and counsel having to do with ability, it doesn't rely on your ability. Do you know where wisdom, understanding, and counsel are found? They are found in a person. I told you that this little string of wisdom, understanding, counsel appears a few different places in the Bible. We saw it in Job. It shows up another time in Proverbs 8. We won't go there right now, but it shows up one other time in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. And I want you to flip over to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. I'll wait for you. We'll start actually in verse 1. Okay, We're going to see this little string of wisdom, understanding, and counsel. Okay, So this is Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Okay, so there's going to be... Jesse is the Uh, father of King David, okay? So there's going to be someone who comes from his lineage, and and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So that that person who comes is going to bear fruit. There will be a result, and his life will bring about good, be fruit. And look at Isaiah 11 too. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding spirit of counsel, and might. Wouldn't it be great to meet that person? Wouldn't it be great to meet someone who everything that they do and all that they are is not at odds with God, but is aligned up with God? And look what kind of world this person brings. If he, if he is going to bear fruit out of wisdom, understanding, and counsel, look what kind of world, this kind of order this person will usher in. Look in verse 3. Spirit, wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel, and might, spirit of knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11 verse 3 says, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see. Or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. Faithfulness will be the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the Lamb. This is the fruit of all of those works that He's done. The, the, the world will be made right the way it ought to be. The wolf shall dwell with the Lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt. Get that. They shall not hurt. Hurt gone. Destruction gone in all my holy mountain. For the earth, and and God's holy mountain is not depicted just as a mountain in Jerusalem here. What's it depicted as? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Wouldn't it be great if there was one person, just one person in the world, who genuinely always, every day, every second, it could be said of them that their delight was in the fear of of the Lord. Wouldn't it be great if there was one person to whom we could go who has never tried to avail against God? That person who didn't just have a reverence for God's power or or goodness, but who supremely delighted in and made known the full range of the attributes of God so that knowing God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God's benevolence, his power, his wisdom, his justice, his holiness, his mercy and his righteousness. I want to submit to you this morning 
I want to submit to you this morning that Proverbs 21 and Job 12 and Isaiah 11 and your life is all meant to point to God's Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember what we said that wisdom and understanding and counsel are about? It's about ability, advantage, usefulness, power, and might. And in the gospel, we see our right place in this world. We can't avail God no matter how much wisdom we may try to bring to the table. But what we also see in the gospel and the good news is God's place in this world. He uses such bigness, the span that he holds off, uh, that measures the cosmos in between his, his hand and his might and his ability for the advantage of his enemies who would seek to avail against him even to the point of a splinter-ridden, bloody cross that they would put him on. And he does that for his enemies. Man, we, we um, as a church, we pray for the nations, right? Uh, we, we pray that God would be with those who are missionaries um, all, over, all over the world. What, what if we made it an effort to also not only pray for missionaries, Christians all over the world, but what if alongside that line of praying for missionaries, you were also praying for enemies, who had slaughtered missionaries. You pray for your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Right? God does this for us because all of us, no matter how morally good you think, you are naturally prone to seeking to avail against God. And that is treason. And that puts us at an, as an enemy. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, enemies, Christ died for us. Because God's salvation and his kingdom come through him condescending to weakness and powerlessness. Death on a cross, those hands that span out the universe, arms wide, wide open, hanging on the cross, that breath that spoke everything in, suffocating, drowning in blood for us as enemies. And the Bible calls that the display of the wisdom, understanding, and counsel of God because God is overcoming our true enemy, Satan, sin, death, the principalities and powers of this earth. And if you want to receive this kingdom, you cannot receive it by moral strength or by being a good person or by trying to live a life... Uh, uh, of consistency, right, or great wisdom, or uh, have complete wisdom. You can't do that. It would cut across the grain. If you would have Jesus, then you must have him through weakness. And Christians talk about weakness in two words, repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. If God's going this way, you're going this way, you turn and go this way with God, that's saying, I don't know it, I'm weak. I'm going to go where you're going, God. That's the first step of repentance, right? Turning and trusting that He is who He says He is and delighting in Him over everything else. That is faith. And what that looks like is if God wis God's wisdom goes one way, then we need to follow. And if your faith isn't the accumulation of personal strength, then faith is looking for strength in Jesus, and delighting in Him. So in Jesus, salvation comes to the world, not by clinging to power, but by losing power. So we receive Him in His kingdom by surrendering your will and trusting Him and identifying with Jesus the poor and the powerless. I want to read... Um, and. A, um, this is not just some preacher thing here. I'm literally just going to read this passage, and then I want to pray. I'm not going to explain anything. I want to finish with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So I'll wait for you just a second to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, if you're reading in your Bible, or the words on the screen. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 
For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I want you to consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God has made our wisdom, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, our boast surely is in you, and we make much of you uh, because of Jesus and what he has done. And so, Lord, we uh, pray that these things that we have heard today would bring you honor and would call us to repent where we need to repent. And, Lord, we sing and we worship you out of the freedom of your good gospel. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.